Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast for Saturday, March 10th, 2018. I'm your host, Andrew Rose. Professor Klump is unfortunately busy tonight and cannot be here. I know, it's really sad. At least he was here last week, but he's not here this week. But what do I got in store for you all this week? Well, unfortunately, some very sad news. As I found out after last week's podcast that David Ogden Stiers has passed away. On top of that, some more sad news. Toonami Asia is shutting down at the end of March. I'm going to be talking about the new Dragon Ball smartphone app that's counting down until it's unveiling. The Sony PlayStation 2 has turned 18 years old. Wow, that's huge. Shonen Jump's 50th anniversary exhibition is going to include a massive manga library. Sign me up now. Amazon has a fix for its creepy Alexa laugh. And oh, I can't wait to talk about that. And the classic Yu-Gi-Oh! anime film is returning to theaters for a two-day event. In all honesty, I say skip it. But I'll explain my thoughts on that when I get to there. And maybe some bonus topics. You never know. It all depends on how the mood strikes me. But anyway, as always, you know the song and dance by now. A-R-H-O-A-D-S hyphen, hyphen 2012 on eBay for all your weird oddity collectible needs. Come on, you know I have something there you want at some point in time. So you can come check me out there if you want to. You can also follow me on Twitter at Otaker Roads, And as well, you can now follow me on my Facebook page, WebDesigner18. So, uh, how was my week? Well, I survived a snowstorm last week, happily. And we survived the snowstorm that hit, the nor'easter that hit on Wednesday. <laughs> and it's interesting, you can tell the amount of snow that we got versus what everything else around us got. I could literally go 13 miles away from where I live, which is how far I have to travel for work, and they got squat, like, like diddly shit in there snow-wise. But yet, if you go down, like, say, five miles into the uh, closest town, and they got its decent amount of snow, but not much. And most of it was melted by Thursday, and I was just shocked by that. But other than, other than that, I got a day off because of the weather. Which, yeah, my wallet didn't like it, but I didn't have to worry about driving in snow. and That makes me happy. It, it really does. I've been playing my Contest of Champions game, really kicking ass and taking names in that. I finally, and I want to say this, I was... Uh, well, I finally starting to get the hang of this new, uh, I guess they can call it a curve if they want to, with the attacks missing and the AI having a ramped up difficulty. I don't know. But on top of that, though, uh, there was a few other things this week that have been going on. One of which I will talk about. I didn't have it in the thing, and I'll start the podcast off with that then. But... Other than that, it's been sort of an interesting week. I've uh, been playing the magical game of Need to Find a New TV. And there's a fun story behind this. Uh, so my grandfather got this TV. We're estimating it to be at least... It'll be at least 10 years old. I want to say come... I think next month. It'll be like 10 years old. And he got the TV. It. I, I swear, I think it was... My mom and I think it was a refurbished job. But we don't know. We, we don't know for sure. But he got this TV, I want to say almost 10 years ago, and it's now starting to give us an issue. Now, it's, now, to be fair, it's been giving us an issue for the last, I want to say, seven years. Whereas, the screen will go completely black. It, it'll just go 100% dark. You can't see anything. The picture goes out. But yet, you still have the audio. And when my grandmother was still alive yet, she would constantly complain about that and go, Oh, the TV's out, the TV's out, you gotta do something to fix it, the TV's out. All I can do is turn it off and turn it back on again. That's literally all I can do. And it's still doing it now, only it's doing it in much higher instances. Uh, like last year, I basically went and blew a lot of dust out of it, thinking maybe that might be the issue. It might just be overheating and triggering the... Uh, screen cutoff for a temperature sensor, but my mom made an interesting comment, told a friend of ours, hey, our TV's crapping out, told her the issue, and our friend goes, that's a sign the TV's going bad. And when my mom told me about, told me that, the first thing that came to my mind is, well, no, duh. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm well aware of that. 
I know the TV's going bad. I, I've been knowing that now for a few years that the TV's been going bad. So I've been trying to track down a replacement for it. And by replacement, I mean cheap. And by cheap, I mean whatever we can afford that I know will work. And I like how a lot of people are going to be thinking, well, why don't you just try this and that? I've been searching on Craigslist, but in all honesty, for the amount of trouble I did up going through on Craigslist with the crap shooting of, is it going to work or isn't it going to work? I'm better off just spending like about 200 bucks and just getting a TV from like Best Buy or Walmart. So that's what we're kind of looking at now, but it's something that we kind of have to fix because we do watch the news on that. So yeah, there, there is that. But other than that, it's been sort of an interesting week. Like I said, snow, weather, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, next week, though, I will be working Saturday morning, unless it snows or circumstances beyond my control prevent that. So uh, if I seem a little sleepy or tired next week, I do apologize, and I want to apologize in advance for that because I have to work next Saturday morning. Just a heads up friendly heads up because I don't know if I'm going to have to work Sunday morning or not. I don't know the next week's schedule until I go in, which is usually on a Wednesday. So I won't know next week's schedule until I go in. So I don't know what I'm going to be. I don't know if I'm working next Sunday or not. So just a heads up. And don't forget, by the way, since you're obviously now listening to this on a Sunday, since I uploaded on a Sunday, just a reminder, uh, Daylight Savings Time happened, for those of you that observe it, and for those of you that care. Uh, basically, what this means is you have to put your clocks ahead an hour. Unless, of course, you live in Florida and parts of Arizona because you're not doing it, as well as some parts of Japan. How oh, I'd like to stay there. <laughs> I don't like Daylight Savings Time. But anyway, that catches you up for how my week went, and let's jump in to the podcast, shall we? We got a lot to do, and not a lot of time to do it. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, one thing that I forgot to mention in the topics list for this week. As many of you out there know, I've been playing a game called Digimon Links. And at this point, it's pretty much just me logging in once a day to collect my freebies because there really wasn't anything worth me trying my hand at. It's one of those... I started playing it at the... I want to say the wrong time, but it was right when it first came out for the tablet. It was no longer like a pre-release or anything like that. And I ended up scoring a Mega, which is the highest level Digimon you can get. I scored a Mega level, and then I ended up getting a second one that I actually worked for. The first one was pretty much gifted to me because I just kept scoring enough stuff to get it just from the first few levels that I was doing. And it's like, oh, cool, now I have enough to get a Mega level. Boom, I got a Mega level. And it just made the game so much easier. Yes, it can still like evolve it, make it stronger and everything, but in all honesty, it's I'd rather just save it to DNA Digivolve it to something stronger. That is, if I can ever get back into the game. See, for the last, and I want to say about a week or so, the game has been down. The servers have stopped functioning. And a video was put out on YouTube, and I did comment on it, because I'm sad that this has happened, because... I miss playing this game. I mean, I'm worried about how my Digimon friends are doing. I mean, I have a War Greymon, a Saber Leomon, and a Metal Edamon. They're probably wondering what's happened to me. So if they're out there in the digital landscape and they can hear me, I'm still here. I haven't forgotten about you. The digital gateway's been closed off. I can't get back to you. I'm trying my best. But apparently the servers uh, has featured a major malfunction and... They put a thing up on their Facebook page explaining that they will be down uh, for a while. They're working as quickly as they can to fix the issue. And in all honesty, it's an online game. Stuff like this is going to happen. This is not something that, oh, okay, this just came out of left field and we weren't expecting this. It's an online game. And in this day and age, that's to be expected. You could have a day one release for a console game that has online features... And they could have server malfunctions that'll screw that up big time. But if you're talking like tablet-based games, yeah, this is a new day and age for this stuff. Stuff like this is going to happen. And what's sad about this is, while you can't access the game, it just sucks for those people that had consecutive logins. Uh, I know my one fan out there will know what I'm talking about. Uh, Capone, Aldrin, you'll know what I'm talking about with consecutive logins because we play uh, Puzzles and Dragons. 
and you get bonuses for every single day you're consecutively logged in. So every single day you log into the game, you get a bonus. And it adds up over time because you'll get some after X amount of days of consecutively logging in. And that's what you were getting with Digimon Links. You were getting consecutive logins like uh, I think I got one at 30. I know I got one at 20. I think I got one at like 30. And there were some that were higher up. Everyone's consecutive login at this point is shot. It's, it's completely gone. And what a lot of the fans are thinking and a lot of the fans and players at this point are going, okay, how are they compensating us? And in all honesty, I mean, I don't want to think that way, but it's true at this point. I mean, I now have an app that has taken up 1.1 gigabytes worth of space on my tablet. I want to know how I'm going to be compensated if I can't play it. I mean, it's not really fair. I play it. I go into it every day. I do some stuff in it. Grand, mostly, like I said, it's just collect my freebies and, you know, tap on my little friends to let them know that I'm thinking about them. But... That's kind of just like taking time away from everybody. I mean, everybody's consecutive logins are shot. Anybody that was doing, like, the event that they had going on is pretty much screwed. Now, they did say they were going to extend that, but they're going to be extending this thing for a good long while at this rate. I mean, like I said, we're looking at at least a week here that this has been down. And I'm still saddened by this because, I mean... This is a game I haven't been able to play for a week. That would be like Contest of Champions suddenly shutting down for an entire week. That would drive me nuts. I mean, okay, sure, I would probably not have to worry about playing the game half a dozen times. I'd probably have a little more free time on my hands. But I would... I'd be lost. That would drive me insane. So, going further on to this... A lot of the players are wondering, how are we going to get compensated? At this point, they might as well just give everybody two free Mega Levels and be done with it. Go, hey, we're sorry you were kicked out of the game. Here's two free Mega Levels for you. And they're randomly chosen from all the Mega Levels that you have access to in the game. Every single one that's in the database currently, here you go. Two of them, you get two Mega Levels at random. Have at it. And be done with it at this point. That's about the best compensation I see anybody getting. I mean, okay, yeah, I wouldn't mind like some Digi Stones and whatnot, but at least two free Mega Levels. That's what would compensate. If it gets to like two or three weeks at this point, you might as well just give us Mega Levels and be done with it. They're probably going to give us like a few dozen Digi Stones or something, which people will instantly use in the capture to grab themselves some decent ones or to get themselves some chips to increase their Digimon's power and stuff like that. But it's still sad that this game is still down. And for those of you out there wondering, as of this recording, and it is 9.24 p.m. on March 10th, it is still down. Because I tried it before I started recording the podcast and it is still down. So... At least it's down for me. I I don't know. Maybe there might be some lucky few out there that can play it. But it's still down for me. But anyway, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about now. So it's really sad that that's uh, out and can't play it. And like I said, in this day and age, it's to be expected with server issues and everything else. But it's still sad that it's gone. It's like dead in the water right now. It's just an app that's taking up space. But don't worry... Because Bandai Namco is still getting some love for me, even though they killed off a game that I actually did like and replaced it with one that I now can't play. I downloaded a One Piece game today. And so long as the file size doesn't go too damn high, I'll probably be playing that for a while. It's actually kind of fun. But if the file size goes too high, then I'm just going to ditch that. Yeah, tablets don't have a lot of space on them. But anyway, uh, there you go. For those of you out there wondering, yes, there is a Facebook page for Digimon Links. Uh, There's more information on there. Uh, Check it out. If you still play the game, be patient. They're working on it. At least I hope they are. At this point, they might as well, like I said, just give everybody two Mega Levels and call it a day. Hey, look, when we get this thing up and running, everybody's getting two Mega Levels. That's the end of it. That's just going to be random Mega Levels that we have access to. That's the end of it. There you go. That'd be the best thing they could do at this point. Okay, so there was a sad uh, topic to start off this week. Well, okay, well, the last topic wasn't really too good either. But uh, last week, 
it was sadly brought to my attention because I had to go and check out Twitter after I finished recording the podcast. Because I thought, oh, what the hell, let me go check out Twitter, see what's happening quick for the night, as I usually do before I log off my laptop. And it was brought to my attention, sadly, that David Ogden Stiers, uh, the actor, has sadly passed away. And now I know a lot of you out there may not know who he is by the name, so let me just give you a little rundown. Uh, a lot of fans, my mom will know him uh, instantaneously. Anyone, and I don't mean to say it this way, but anyone over the age of 40 will know who he is. Almost instantaneously. Just from the name alone. Uh, his main role that he played uh, acting-wise was Major Charles Emerson Winchester on the hit television show MASH. Uh, he had that role from... Uh, Oh, crap. What season did he... I think it was like season six he started. And he ran to the show's conclusion in 1983. So he ran that for a long time. Okay, 1977 to 1983. I just looked... I have the Wikipedia page up for him. Uh, Sadly, he passed away from complications uh, due to bladder cancer last Saturday at the age of 75. He has had a huge uh, acting career. And what struck me as odd, because I did not know this until, and I want to th- say it was Anime Abandoned or Anime America. No, it was Anime America. That's right. Uh, put up a picture on their Facebook page, and all of a sudden it clicked in my mind, oh crap, I didn't know he did the voice of this. Because he did a lot of voiceover stuff. He did some uh, television shows, some movies, some video games. He did voiceovers. So, there's a whole uh, list of them here. I want to scroll down and get to them. So, he did voice work. Uh, He provided voice work for dozens of films and television projects. His first work was one of uh, George Lucas' earliest films, uh, the critically acclaimed THX 1138 in which he was incorrectly billed as David Ogden Steers, S-T-E-E-R-S, instead of S-T-I-E-R-S. That's okay. Look at uh, Ty Trung, the Yellow Ranger that was in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. She did a thing, uh, she was in one movie, and they didn't even give her the right credit. That sucks. Um, He voiced a PBS documentary film such as Rick Burns Project... Uh, New York, a documentary film in 2010, the Peabody Award winner, The Lord is Not on Trial Here Today, and several episodes of the documentary television series American Experience, including Ansel Adams, uh, 2002, uh, also directed by Rick Burns in 1992. He voiced Mr. Piccolo in the animated English-dubbed version of Porco Rosso. For those of you that don't know what that is, uh, that's an old school anime film. Uh, not exactly one of my personal favorites. Uh, in fact, to be, I steer clear of that every time it's in the discount bin. He collaborated with Disney on eight animated features, including the 1991 movie Beauty and the Beast as Cogsworth. He also provided the opening narration. In 1955, he was Governor Raycliffe and Wiggins in Pocahontas. 1996, he was the Hunchback of Notre Dame's Archdeacon. Yes. For those of you that never saw that movie, that's actually a good Disney movie. I mean, it's kind of creepy. It gets way off the rails. That's like a Disney movie back when they were still trying to find themselves Disney movie. Uh, He was in 2001's Atlantis, The Lost Empire as Mr. Harcourt. And in 2002's Lilo and Stitch as Jumba Jacoba. That's kind of sad. I mean, I like Lilo and Stitch, but I just did not know that was him. And it just keeps going on and on and on. There's a few more I'll get to, but I, there's still some more on here. Um, he was in the uh, movie Hoodwinked. For anybody that's ever seen that movie, he was in the movie Hoodwinked. He played the frog, Nicky Flippers, the frog detective who was dispatched to Granny's house. He was the voice of Pop's of uh, Pop's father, Mr. Mallard, 
in the animated TV series regular show, which I did not know. And he did voice in several video games, including Icewind Dale, uh, Kingdom Hearts 2, Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep as Jeff Zandi in uh, Uryu, Ages Beyond Mist, and Escher in Mist 5, End of Ages. So, there's just so many things that he did, and it's just so weird now looking back at this. But what got my attention, and I want to pull this up, because it's what caught my attention the most here. So let me scroll down into this. Okay, I know it's on here somewhere. Yeah, he was a uh, Grandpa Piccolo in uh, Porco Rosso. Let's see here. That's uh, big seal. This is like a whole bunch that he's done. Um, there was one. Where are you on here? Damn it! I know you were in here somewhere. Where are you? What year did that come out? It's kind of weird. So I know he did the voice of one thing, and that's what I'm trying to find. And I can't find it. So there, let me just read through some of these, and I'll probably find it on the way. Uh, starting from 1971, in film, he was... Uh, let's see, he had the pro owner in Drive, he said. Uh, THX 1138 in 1971. Uh, oh God, 1977, The Cheap Detective in 1978, Magic in 78, uh, Breaking Up's Hard to Do in 79, and just so many of them. Like I said, you, you can literally just, I just had the Wikipedia page open for it. Seriously, it's actually just worth it to check it out. But there was one that he did that took me by surprise, and I can't find it now in this, and that's starting to bother me. Uh, come on, where are you? Yeah, the Hunchback of Notre John, he was the Archdeacon. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, he was Cogsworth in Beauty and the Beast, the Enchanted Christmas. Let's see here. Uh, he was in Jungle to Jungle in 1997. That was a good movie. I actually remember seeing that. Uh, let's see here. Meet Wally Sparks. I That sounds familiar to me for some reason. Bell's Magical World, that direct-to-video piece of crap. He reprised his role in uh, Pocahontas 2, Journey to the New World. My Neighbor, the Yamadas, he was the narrator in the English version, Tom Katz, Dr. Crawford, Lannis, let's see here, The Majestic, he was Doc uh, Stanton, Mickey's Magical Christmas showed in, snowed in at the House of Mouse, he was Cogsworth again, uh, he did, uh, ah, Murder, Shiro. here it is, 2001, this is what got my attention when... I saw the picture, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, I did not know that he did that. And that's what made me think about this. He was in Spirited Away. For those of you that don't know what that is, that is one of the few Hayao Miyazaki movies that I hold in so high of regard that I will defend that to the day I die from anyone that says it sucks. That is a wonderfully written story, beautiful artwork, beautiful animation. It is one of the few movies that I don't own. Of Hayao Miyazaki. And it is just so well done. He did the voice of Kamaji. In the English version of that. Now for those of you that don't know. Kamaji is the spider like creature. That is in charge of the furnace. At the bathhouse. The one that helps the girl in the movie. You know to keep her secret. He holds on to her. You know human clothes. While she gets the outfit that she has to wear. While working at the bathhouse. You know he helps out at the end. By giving her the tickets in order to travel on the railway to save the day in the end. It's That's the character he voiced, and I did not know that. It was 2001. I thought that came out earlier, but then I forgot that the English release only came out in 2001. But there's so many more. Uh, he was in Lilo and Stitch and all of its uh, renditions. Uh, Cable Beacon, the cat that looked at the king. Uh, Springtime with Rue, he was the narrator. Uh, Teacher's Pet. Hoodwinked, he was Nikki Flippers. Uh, two more, you know, Lilo and Stitch things. Pooh's Heffalup Halloween movie. He was the narrator. Uh, Lady in Wa uh, yeah, Lady in the Water. He was the narrator, uncredited. Uh, Leroy and Stitch. He was again Doctor Jumba, Jacoba. Uh, together for the first time, not dead yet. Hoodwink Two, Hood versus Evil. He reprised the role as Nikki Flippers, and 
just so many things. He, he did so many things. And like I said, television, there's just so many things he did in that, too. Uh, Kojak, Carly's Ang- uh, Charlie's Angels, the Mary, Tyler- uh, the Mary Tyler Moore Show, Rhoda, This Is Life, uh, The Tony Randall Show, uh, his huge role in MASH for 131 episodes, uh, The Paper Chase, whatever that is, um, Mur- he was in an episode of, he was in three episodes of uh, Murder, She Wrote, don't recommend that show at all, uh, he played Flaky Pete in two episodes of ALF. I do remember that one. Uh, you got he was in Wings, Star Trek The Next Generation. He did have a role in, and I do know this, uh, Stargate Atlantis. Because he played like the replicated thing on the one planet. So that was kind of cool. I do know that. Um, Let's see here. What other things you got here? Uh, American Experience. He was a narrator. Uh, so you Poltergeist the Legacy, Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, he was Theodore Quinn in one episode Farewell Appearance. Uh, 101 Dalmatians the series, he was Vlad, it was a voice role. Uh see here, Ally McBeal, two guys, a girl in a pizza place. I actually remember that show, and it's sad that I remember that show. Uh he was in the Angry Beavers! That was a that was a that's classic Nickelodeon right there. Uh he was Byron Beaver. Now, The Practice, The Outer Limits, that's an interesting show from time to time. The Wild Thornberries, ugh, don't even get me started. Um, let's see here, Disney's House of Mouse, he just reprised his role as Cogsworth. Uh, let's see here, he was in Justice League, the 2002 one, as a, Solva- a Solovar slash car owner, a voice role in three episodes. Let's uh, see here, he was in Frasier, Touched by an Angel. Lilo and Stitch the series. Well, of course, because he played the one character. He was in 66 episodes. Oh, he's in an episode of Static Shock. Wow. You just learned so much about these people after they pass. And that's a sad thing at this point. Oh, okay. He was in an episode of Leverage. I actually watched that show. I no, no, That's going to make me want to rewatch that show again. So, yeah, he was in that show. He was in Leverage. He was in Stargate Atlantis. He was Oberoth in three episodes. I do remember that. I, I, that one I do know. Uh, he was a narrator for Nova in one episode. And his major thing for five years was on regular show, which I didn't know. I did not know that he was in regular show. I know that uh, Mark Harmel, the uh, vo- Luke Skywalker, uh, did the voice of uh, Skips. I was blown away when I learned that. Regular show ended in 2016. And I'm still getting blown away two years later. So that's television. Video game wise, it's sadly a little less than that. Uh, Kingdom Hearts 2, Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. The first two, uh, Kingdom Hearts 2 and Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix, he was Cogsworth. And in Birth by Sleep, he was Dr. Jumba Jacoba and Doc. So. There's that. Uh, he was in a game called Toonstruck. He was King Hugh. Uh, Icewind Dale. He was a narrator. Uh, Disney Stitch Experiment 626. He was, you know, Jacoba again. Uryu Ages Beyond Miss. He was Jeff Zandi. Uryu to Deny. He was uh, Dr. Richard Watson. And Mist 5 End of Ages. He was Escher. So the video game voice roles he had were petty compared to. Everything else he did, uh, got stage credits and everything else. But what he did then, uh, for a good chunk of his life after that, he did uh, conduct symphonies. And that is something that's up here. Um, hold on a second. Yeah. Uh, he's a... Styers was an associate conductor for the Newport, Oregon Symphony Orchestra and the Ernest Bloch Music Festival. He also guest conducted over 70 orchestras around the world, including the Oregon Mozart Players, the Vancouver Symphony, the Virginia Symphony, the Oregon Chamber Players, and the, I'm going to mispronounce this, I know it, the Yaquina Oregon Chamber Orchestra, as well as orchestras in San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, Chicago, and Toronto. So, not only was he an established actor, he did voice work on a lot of animated stuff, and he was just a conductor. The man literally did everything. But sadly, like I said last week, 
uh, it was announced that he passed away in his home in Newport, Oregon at the age of 75 from complications related to bladder cancer. So it's sad that he's gone. His legacy will live on. I mean, in all honesty, I I did not know that he did so many voiceover roles. And in all honesty, I don't think a lot of people did unless they're really hip to everything or they know everything like the anime community that I listen to. I, I'm not part of that. But, you know, they have themselves so wired into it that, okay, they know every single voice and which actor it is, the name of the person doing the voice, and so on and so forth. I'm not that in-depth to the anime. I wish I was, but I'm not. They'll remember him for that. What's going to be ironic for me, because I grew up watching the reruns of it, I'm going to know him as Major Charles Everson Winchester III from MASH. Because that's what I grew up watching. And like I said, I'm 28. For anybody out there wondering. I'm not like in my 40s. And the only reason why I know about the show is because I would watch the reruns in the afternoon on TV. A couple TV channels had reruns played. And one channel actually had like four or five episodes a day. So you quickly learn the entire show quickly. It's not one of those, oh, it's just going to be, I'm just going to watch like a couple. No, you learn the whole show fast. So, yeah, like I said, it's sad that he's gone. He will be greatly missed. And that that's a definite. He's just going to be greatly missed so much. But if you want to see more of the stuff that he did, uh, just Google search him. Uh, I'll have his name in the description. So you'll be able to just copy and paste the link to Google search him. And yeah, I mean, he's just going to be, you know, really gone. So I just have a moment of silence here for a second if we can. To uh, remember Charles Emerson Winchester or David Ogden Stiers, if we may. May you rest in peace. Okay, so fans of Toonami, this should not be news at this point. So, it was announced back on March 6th, which is four days ago, that Toonami Asia is shutting down at the end of March. Yes, I know it's sad, but here's the thing. It's transmitted in Southeast Asia. So what is it? Well, it's bad and good at the same time, but it's what is it entirely? It's basically just an on-demand service in Southeast Asia. It's the Toonami Channel, which, in all honesty, I think we should have here in the U.S. I'm sorry. We should have a Toonami Channel. That's the main issue, is that it keeps getting hampered and hindered by Cartoon Network and Adult Swim. Give it its own channel, let it be on 24 hours a day, I guarantee you, you will see ratings. But, that's beside the point. So, uh, they got official word from uh, Turner Asia that Toonami Asia will be shutting down at the end of March. And... It's going to cease the transmissions. They're thanking all their fans for watching and all of their amazing support. Uh, they're telling you to check out Cartoon Network and Boomerang for more great kids entertainment and everything else. So fans started to notice though, that something was going on when the Toonami Asia dub of Dragon Ball Super stopped recording a few months back at uh, Bang Zoom. I don't know what it is. I've tried looking it up and it's... I just threw my hands up in the air and said, okay, who cares at this point? Uh, they've also learned that Toonami India may be shutting down as well. But they do not have official word about that. Now, keep in mind, I only got this information, I want to say Wednesday, so I don't know if there's any update or not to this at the, as of this recording. Uh, Turner Asia also noted that the Toonami brand may live on in some other form in the future, so this may not be the end of Toonami in the Asian market. Here's the thing, and it better not be. Let's think about this honestly for a second. What is Toonami? It is literally the home of Japanese anime. It is anime's best friend. When you think anime, the first thing that comes to your mind is Toonami. At least it better be like within the top five things that come to your mind. So, if it's shutting down in the Asian market, that's kind of a scary thing to think about. 
Because then what are they going to get to replace it? Nothing. I mean, is it starting to go the way of, you know, how Toonami went here in the U.S.? And that brings up another interesting question. So if Toonami is shutting down over there, how long until it shuts down over here? Again. As you figure, you got Toonami India that may be shutting down. Toonami Asia shutting down at the end of the month. Does that, you know, give Toonami here in the U.S. a shot in the dark of surviving anymore? I mean, let's think about it. Right now, it's standing pretty safe, starting at 10.30 at night and going to 3.30 in the morning. Or, no, sorry, going to 4 o'clock in the morning. I had to think about that for a minute. So, it's got itself a pretty decent, you know, foothold on a Saturday night and early Sunday morning. But here's the thing. How many people are going to remember, hey, I can watch this. A lot of people were DVRing it and then watching it during the day. You'll still get the ratings from the DVR because the DVR has to record it. So it has to have itself tuned to that channel in order to get the recording. Hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I did watch a video explaining how that works. Ha! But what bothers me is that that was the reason that they cut it down in the first place. Then all of a sudden, everything just started pumping back up. It's like, no, you can't cut it out. Don't do this. Don't screw with it. There's nothing wrong with it. And then all of a sudden, they start getting new content, and boom, it picks back up in intensity. But what bothered me about this is that, like I said, if... Tsunami Asia and Tsunami... Well, Tsunami Asia is done at the end of the month. But if Tsunami India is going, what's stopping Tsunami here in the U.S. from going? And that's my question at this point. Because if it keeps shutting down everything else around the world, it's going to become like Toys R Us. And Toys R Us is already going to be shutting its doors pretty much this week. This coming week at this point. Because they've announced that... I mean, there's like six or seven articles online that... Well, they're closing their doors as of this, you know, this coming week. They could be, all their doors could be locked up tight for good. And my grandfather, mom, and I were talking about that today. And it kind of falls in the same category as the whole Toonami thing. Whereas in this case, Toonami keeps themselves going by one thing. Anime. That is their literal thing that keeps them going. What killed it the first time when it came back... Uh, to Cartoon Network and to the airwaves was that they started throwing cartoons on there that Cartoon Network still had the license for, but that they didn't want to put up anymore on their Cartoon Network time slots because they want Cartoon Network time slots to be nothing but dimwitted programming to screw with the minds of people. Now, granted, I still like Steven Universe, even though a lot of people are saying it's pretty much done in the water. Which, in all honesty, and I'm going to say this, if they want to end that show... I say go for it and just let Cartoon Network rot at this point. Because Cartoon Network screwed their... Cartoon Network screwed the pooch. They made their beds. They got a lie in it. When they made Teen Titans go, when they okayed that, that was where they made their beds. It's time to lie in them. But at this point, you often have to think, okay, so what's going to be next for it? And like I said, they don't know. And if Toonami India is shutting down, you know, it's not going to know. But how this compares to what I was saying earlier with the Toys R Us thing is that what was keeping them in business was that they had some of the stuff before anybody else got it. So in all honesty, yeah, I could just have gone to like a video store, picked up the newest anime right off the shelf, bought it, and went home and watched the whole first like season or the first part of the first season. And just have to wait week after week after week to see it on Toonami. Or, hey... I don't know about this. I don't want to spend too much on my internet bill this month, you know, to watch it. I don't want to go to, like, a crappy site like, you know, this one here or this one here. And I don't want to get stuck in the ad space of Crunchyroll to pull up a thing. Let me see what this is like. Let me watch an episode of the English dub. Because a lot of the sites out there will have it subbed and not dubbed. Hey, I want to see what this is going to be like in English. See if it's going to be worth my time to buy it. Or it's great, you could just turn on the Japanese sub and just use Japanese audio with the English subtitles. But that's beside the point at this. That's mute at this point. Toonami was basically a place where, hey, I don't know if I want to buy it yet. Let me check it. And that's how it went. So, it's sad that it's going, at least over in Asia. 
But like I said, what does that mean for us here in the U.S.? I don't know. They don't even know. It's just sad to think about. that It's going in one place. It might be going in another. And that's just like a ticking clock for, hey, your time's almost up. And it's sad but true. And I just hate thinking about it like that, but that's really how it is. It's sad but true, but for now, Toonami Asia is shutting down at the end of March. Uh, it's really sad. Hopefully, Toonami India doesn't go the same way. Hopefully, Toonami here in the U.S. sticks around. If not, I'm going to say it this way. If they can't stick around on the air, give them their own YouTube channel and just have that thing be live all the time and be done with it at this point. I mean, there are a few channels that are always live, like uh, there's like a Nightcore one that's always live, and so on and so forth. Just give Toonami its own YouTube channel and be done with it. Because then you'll be getting, you can get the monetization from YouTube by having X amount of subscribers. I'll subscribe! I'll, even be, I'll subscribe to you! If they come out with a full 24-7 Toonami YouTube channel, that's official by the way, not somebody that's just tapping into streams somewhere... I will be more than happy to subscribe to that. And I mean that. I will subscribe. Not if it's on YouTube Red, though. But I will subscribe. But anyway, there you go. The future of Toonami in Asia is... Well, it's bleak. It's very, very bleak. Okay, let's get off the sad topics here, damn it. Let's talk about something interesting. Let's talk about something amazing. Let's talk about something that gets me excited. There's a new Dragon Ball smartphone app coming. Okay, I don't own a smartphone, but hopefully it'll be available for tablets. But anyway, uh, there was a countdown started back on March 5th. And as of right now, since that was five days ago, it should be sitting at about uh, 11 days. It's scheduled to come out on March 21st. So at least more details about the app. It's scheduled to come out on March 21st. Until then, uh, we're left to speculate. What is this app going to be about? It's going to be, you know, a new tweet from uh, VJump described it as a Dragon Ball new work app game. Uh, could be connected to the upcoming Dragon Ball film or the series. And it's, well, you know, a game of some kind. Which... Don't get me wrong, there aren't a lot of decent Dragon Ball-related games for tablet devices or for smartphones in general. Because a lot of ones you have are third-party developed ones or fan-made ones that are crap. And yes, I can hear a lot of people that design them now screaming in agony, My game isn't crap! Here's the thing. If your game causes glitches, if your game can't be played, it's crap. I hate to be the bearer of bad news for you, but that's what it is at this point. It's crap. If you honestly can't play the game, it's crap. So, the new app is headed to smartphones. Like I said, I hope it's going to be available for tablets. Because I would love to have a decent Dragon Ball game. Even if it's like an RPG style, I'll take it. So long as the uh file size isn't going to exceed a crap ton of amounts because that the one thing that pisses me off with tablets is that size limitations i can understand it if it had like a hard drive and it was a game console okay i can't put anything bigger than what i have space wise but with tablets you literally lose a lot of space just for the basic system operations like a program that's already built into it that you can't get rid of. You can't stop it. You can't uninstall it because it's built in. It's an instant built-in program. Believe me, there's like 8 eight to 12 on my tablet alone that I could get rid of because I don't use at all. I don't use them. And it bothers me because I'm stuck with them. They constantly update. They're constantly taking up space. And it's just annoying. I can't use them. They do me no damn good. Why do I have to have them? Because they're built into the tablet for everybody. And that's what bothers me with that. But if this is going to be something that's going to uh, be like a fun game or something, if it comes out for tablets, I will download it, check it out. 
But otherwise, we just got to wait till the 21st at this point to find out what's going on. So we got to wait 11 more days. Well, okay, it'll be 10 days by the time I upload the podcast. 11 days as of now to find out what's going on. I'm looking forward to this. I, I really am. Because it, it, it's exciting. I can't wait. All right, time to talk about one of my all-time favorite video game consoles. Yes, I did play some video game consoles back in the day. In fact, to be, I actually own three of this one. Yes, three. Ah, ah, ah. One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. For those of you that were wondering, that was from the count from Sesame Street. The Sony PlayStation 2 has turned 18 years old. Almost two decades of gaming goodness. So many people will remember this game console. It, it came out... Uh, on October 26th of, I don't even remember what year at this point. And it's funny, so I'm looking right at the information from the top, from the article. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, it was released on October 26th, October 26th, uh, 18 years ago today. Okay, okay, here it is. Uh, it was originally released in Japan on March 4th, 2000, and on October 26th of the same year. So, the PS2 sold a crap ton. 155 million units around the world. I own three of the slim version, not the fat version. There were two versions of it. I own three of the slim versions. Uh, the console featured backwards compatibility with the original PlayStation games, which is what made it so cool for a lot of people. They could just take their PlayStation games, instantly pop it into the PS2, and boom! You don't have to... Stop playing your game. You can still keep going with the fun, provided your memory card worked. <laughs> that was the only downside. It had the ability to play DVDs, which in the early 2000s was a huge thing. Nowadays, with the PS3 and PS4, it's Blu-ray, 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 I don't care. Seriously. Uh, the console flew off the shelves at launch, quickly trouncing the Sega Dreamcast, basically Banging it! I tried to think of the word here. So, I apologize for that little glitch there. A uh, little stop. I had to think of the word. It banged it into the ground and basically finished it off. Here you go! And into the ground you go! Stay down this time. It, it was done. The Dreamcast had no chance of competing with the PS2. Uh, the PlayStation 2's main competition was the GameCube and the Xbox. Ironically, I've actually owned one of each of those. I owned a GameCube for a crap ton of years, played some great games. Zoid's Battle Engine was one that I remember so fondly. Super Mario Sunshine, uh, Tales of Symphonia. Oh, God, I remember playing Tales of Symphonia. Oh, boy, I remember playing Tales of Symphonia. As far as the Microsoft Xbox, I got one uh, for free from my buddy of mine. Yep, no games for it or anything. So yeah, so like I said, I had I got I had one of each. Uh, yeah. So the best-selling titles for it included Grand Theft Auto 3. Never played it. Never owned it. Don't want it. Uh, Vice City and San Andreas. Gran Turismo 3 and 4. I did play. Uh, I think it was Gran Turismo 3. That wasn't too bad. It was kind of fun. Uh, Final Fantasy 10 and 12. Didn't play either of those. And Metal Gear Solid 2. Didn't play that either. In Japan, though, Sony marked the 18th birthday of the PlayStation 2 with a tweet featuring its iconic opening screen. Ah, oh, I remember that opening screen. You want to know? I remember seeing it so many times because I remember loading up my games and seeing that opening screen with the PlayStation logo. Ah. Oh. But anyway, I own three of these things. The slim version, like I said. And what what it was that bothered me with this is that all three of them died the same way. Uh, the first one, which I had from uh, January, I want to say, 2nd. Yeah, January 2nd of 2008, straight through until like... Uh, I want to say 2009, maybe 2010. I had that. Played the crap out of it. I mean, I was playing that thing every single night. The discs wouldn't spin anymore. The lens wouldn't read it. It and 
tried to took it right back, sold it to GameStop, got used the credit, bought another one. Played the crap out of it. Same thing happened. This time, however, when that happened, I actually was a little more proficient in the ways of fixing my stuff. So a friend of mine helped me out by getting the parts for me. And unfortunately, they didn't work. Yeah, go figure. And I, it's funny that I hooked it up exactly the same way that the other one was hooked up. Put them in the exact same way. Wouldn't read it like son of a bitch. I was pissed. Uh, sadly, that one went. But because I had the new parts in it, it just didn't want to read it. Sold it back to GameStop. Used the credit again and bought number three. Number three, I played for the longest time. About half a year. Then, same issue. And this was when I just threw my hands up in the air and said, Okay, that's it. I'm not meant to have a PlayStation 2 anymore. Uh, it was around this point in time though, that the PS3 started coming out. So a lot of PlayStation 2 stuff was uh, dead in the water and gone or really, really cheap. Because I was getting... I don't want to say... I was going to GameStop and picking up um, 99 cent games. Just the disc itself, 99 cent games, and I was just playing those. Uh, occasionally, I got one that actually had the box, like uh, Shiny Force EXA. I had that. Um, oh, God, what was another? Oh, Dynasty Warriors Gundam 2. I pre ordered that. That was the only game I have ever pre ordered in my entire life, was Dynasty Warriors Gundam 2. I played that thing mercilessly. But it was just sad when the game, my system started to die. Just started, I'm like, you know what? That's it. Screw it. And I was just selling off the stuff. Because I remember one game that I had for it. And it's funny is that I kind of wish I had like six of them right now. Because they're still worth a crap ton. It <laughs> shocked the crap out of me how much this went for. Uh, I played the Dot .hack uh, original four set. That was Dot .hack um, Infection, Mutation... Outbreak and Quarantine. And what those were were basically a retelling of the Dot Hack story. Now, this this was a separate story that was in its own like two volume manga. Really good, really well done, by the way. I, I liked it. I played it first, and this is ironic. I played the first one, I didn't like it, took it back to GameStop, traded it in, and got something else. Then a few weeks later, it was sitting on the shelf there just looking at me going, I really want to go home with you. I'm a good game. Give me a chance. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, all right, screw it. Come on. You're only five bucks. Let's go. And I bought it, took it home, played through the first part that I'd already done, and I started getting into the other stuff. And I'm like, hey, this isn't a bad game. Huh. I wonder how much more of this there is. So then I looked it up and I'm like, oh, there's still three more of them to go yet. Part four was the hardest to find. I had one copy of it. It worked for a couple days. And by work, I mean, that was the time when my console was starting to crap out on me. So I'm like, okay, that's great. Not going to be able to play this one. And what's funny is that I had found that one before I found uh, volume three. Because I wanted to play them in order because you have to transfer the data from each one to the next one on your memory card. It's like, oh, cool. Okay, so if I beat this one, it gives you a flag. Then you can go back in. You can do a little more in that one. Get yourself to a good point. Like, get a whole bunch of weapons. Upgrade your character. Stuff like that. And transfer it into the, you know, the next one so that you're all set and ready to go. And I did that for each one. When you get to number four, after you beat the baddie at the end, you just get a flag that says you cleared the game, and then there's more you have to do. There's uh, one final dungeon, which I never was able to complete, because you have to data drain the crap out of everything, and it, you just get corrupted way too quickly. I never found a way to avoid that corruption. And you just got... I, I just got my butt kicked. Then there was a... Uh, you have to collect all the weapons and items, and it gets registered, and afterwards you get something. Never did that, because when I was getting a weapon that I couldn't equip, because I was a Twin Blade character, I gave it to 
one of my other teammates to improve their power. Which, in all honesty, it's it's an RPG. That's what you do. You have to give strength to help out. You can't fly solo in one of those. Teamwork's the key in one of those games. So I did that. I mean, I got fond memories of this. I did that, played that, loved it. But then when my system started crapping out for the third and final time, and I'm like, screw it, that's it, I'm done. I popped it up on eBay. And this was one of my first uh, eBay uh, games that I sold. I'm pretty sure it was like one of my first. At least I think it was one of my first. And I'm like, it pained me to do it. I'm like, I could have just... I could just wait, find myself a backwards compatible PS3. Can't be that difficult. But then I'm like, no, I don't really have the money to spend on it. Screw it. We, you know, screw it. I need the money anyway. So I sold uh, part four. I'd already sold part uh, one, two, and three at this point. And it really saddens me because I kind of wish I still had like all four of them. To be specific, I wish to God right now I had six copies of volume four. Brand spanky new or like new sitting right beside me. And I'm going to get to why in a moment. I plop it up on eBay. eBay's recommended price at the time was a whopping $98. I'm not joking. That was the buy it now price. This is another case of I should have put it on an auction, not as a buy it now. I'd done that once before. I had a uh, Digimon card that was extremely rare. I didn't even know about it. I know now, and I can't find another one. And I put it up on a buy it now. Somebody grabbed it. I had it too low of a price. I didn't know what I was selling. I didn't know it was going to be that popular, and I kicked myself every single day. To this point, that I didn't put that on a, you know, an auction, just like the dot hack game, that thing sold in one night for the ninety-eight dollars plus the shipping. I mean, I cleared a hundred bucks with that, and that scared the crap out of me. So I'm like, it's a PS2 game, and I'm like, it's it's a PS2 game. The PS3 is out. The PS3 is kicking ass. How is this game worth this much? Only to be reminded in the back of my mind, wait, stupid, how many times did you have a hard time finding this thing? I went through three copies. I had the original one that I found that I took back, traded because it didn't work, got my money back. Found a second one that was missing the game disc. I bought this from a GameStop. I'm still to the life of me to this day. I am trying to figure out how that employee opened that up, looked at that, realized, okay, it has a disc, not actually looking at the disc. And I'm like, I wanted to just stare upon the disc for a moment. I'm really glad I did that that day. I'm out in the car, out in the parking lot. I open up the case and I'm like, this is the bonus DVD. This is the bonus DVD. Where's the game disc? Took it right back in. Told the person, hey, I just went out to look at this. It's This is the bonus disc. This isn't the game. And all of a sudden, the person goes, oh, great. So it was, okay, here's your money back. I apologize for this. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I am never going to find a copy of the, thir- of the fourth game. And I find it at another GameStop. Quickly grabbed it. I thought to be it was the exact same day. Because I ended up going over to the mall then. There was a GameStop in the mall. And I found it. Same day. Same copy of the game. Same volume I was looking for. Right in there. Game was there. I was like, perfect. I got it. It's mine. I'm happy. Played through the first, the second one. Played, or finished the second one. Played through the third one. Got into the fourth one. Beat it. to the, Beat the story mode. And that was it. So, like, so many memories that I have uh, from the PlayStation 2. It's 18 years old. I'm impressed with that. But, like I said, so many memories I have from that. I mean, I played Shiny Force EXA. That was a fun game. Uh, one of the worst games I ever played for that was a Cubix game. As well as that crappy uh, Duel Masters game. Ugh. That was abysmally piss poor. 
And the only game that ever really pissed me off, and it, this is what's funny, as I bought this, it was a, uh, it was one of those purchases that it's a Friday, I got a weekend coming up, I got nothing to do, no homework, because I was at this point I was going to tech school, I'm like I got no homework this weekend, I don't have to worry about any like family coming to visit, I can totally throw myself into a game. Let's see what GameStop has in the El Cheapo bit. And I got a copy of... I'm trying to think what the name of it was here. Um, <coughs> oh, come on, oh, crap. I have the DVD of it. Um, oh, crap. Oh, man, this is, this is going to bug me. Um, Zone of the Ender. That's what it was. So I popped this in. And I'm like, this is going to be a kick-ass weekend. I literally burned through that game in one night. I, I, I'm not joking. I went through the game in one night. Played the tutorial. Played through the levels. I even played through the difficult level where you can't get hit even once until you get to the one section to repair your bot. I get into there, repair it, go out, kick, you know, kick ass and take names. Finish the game in one night and I'm like... I paid two bucks for that. I'm like, I didn't even get two dollars worth of fun out of that. I'm like, that's it? I'm like, that that's it? I, that's it? Siri, that, that's it? I got more fun out of the Shaman King game that I wanted when I was younger, when I was really getting into Shaman King. I'm like, that's it? That's it? Seriously? But yeah, it was a horrible game. But anyway, if you had a PlayStation 2 and you loved it, I'm with you. I loved mine. I loved all three of mine. I had three of the slimline ones. I had the Guitar Hero game, the guitar, which I still have the guitar for. So I'm sadly going to get rid of that because I have no use for that anymore. And that's taking up space. But yeah, I had the whole, I had the games, I had games for, I loved that system. That's a system that will always be near and dear to my heart. PlayStation 2. Though it can never beat some of the fun games that I had for the GameCube. Yep. Alright, who's up for taking a trip to Japan? Well, if you answered yes, cool. Sadly, I can't go. I'm too poor. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Shonen Jump's 50th anniversary exhibition is going to be including a massive manga library. This is just huge. So, you thought that manga cafes uh, had a lot of comics. Well, you can think again. The Shonen Jump 50th Anniversary Exhibition, hosted in Roppongi, Tokyo, will, and I do apologize, by the way, if I mispronounce that, uh, will have virtually every volume of the magazine available for reading from March 15th to the 26th. That's 50 years of shonen -y goodness. Or you could just do what so many of us did that had the print magazine and just read the print magazine. I mean, you can easily eBay half of those. I, mean, I have my own... I got like three or four boxes filled with them. I, I want to put them all in one box. It's, I got to make a note of that. Next time I go to Walmart, pick up a big box. Hey, Mom, I know you listen to my podcast. Remind me of that next time I go to Walmart. I got to get a box. There. That's an instant way to, for me to remind of stuff. Like I said, everything anything can happen on this podcast. <laughs> but anyway, uh, meanwhile, a visual for the part three of the exhibition, which covers manga release in the 2000s up to now, has been revealed. The two most prominent characters on the poster are, to no one's surprise, Luffy from One Piece and Naruto from, well, Naruto. Yes, I know. Okay, the reason why is they're the two biggest names in shonen history. I mean... One Piece is still going, for God's sake. Naruto may have ended. Boruto's taken over. One Piece is still going. So, part two of the exhibition is covering uh, the 90s. It's going to run from March 19th to June 17th. And part three from July 17th to September 30th. The exhibitions and manga library are all found at the Mori Arts Center Gallery in Tokyo. Exhibitions cost 2,000 yen for general admission, while the manga library is free. But let me guess, 
I gotta pay the 2,000 yen in order to get into the building where the manga library is, right? So in other words, I have to pay the 2,000 yen probably to go to the manga library. Of course I do. So is anyone out there brave enough to read every volume of Shonen Jump for the last 50 years? You do realize I'm probably driving insane. I mean, no offense. Try reading some. Try reading like 50 years worth of stuff. <laughs> but uh, here's how the official site describes part two of the exhibition. The Weekly Shonen Jump exhibition is an exhibit to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Weekly Shonen Jump by displaying its fond its founding up to the present. The long-awaited second round is finally here. It is called the Weekly Shonen Jump Exhibition Volume Two, the 1990s. A historical 6.53 million copies in circulation. The super popular Shonen Jump heroes of the 90s, who are still loved by worldwide fans today, will all be gathered in Rapungi. I do apologize again if I mispronounce that. This exhibition will release the original hand-drawn illustrations and display and displays of the creative world of Jump's proud artists. Don't miss this chance to join the manga exhibition to experience the energy and what made the record of 6.53 million copies in 1990s weekly Shonen Jump in Japanese publishing history. Yeah. Then again, I kind of ha- lost my fondness for Shonen Jump when they went digital instead of doing the print magazine, and that is where they lost me. They could have literally just made that, and I'm going to say it this way. As I was thinking about that all week, they could have easily just made the print magazine a two-issue-a-year thing. Six months' worth of manga in one volume, two volumes per year. Do you realize how people would have reacted to that? They would have been ecstatic for that. Have one released in June, one released in December. Right there. But sadly, no, we didn't get that. Instead, they went to Shonen Jump Alpha, so you can get it the same week. If you pay via credit card to keep your subscription, I just let mine go and got the refund. I still miss my Shonen Jump, though. But I have all the old ones to keep me company. At least until the Silverfish get after them. Then again, I've had Silverfish in my room, and they seem to avoid my Shonen Jump. As if they know what will happen if they touch even one of them. Bad, bad things. Very bad things. <laughs> Man, but anyway, if you're looking forward to trying your that, to trying your luck at reading every single uh, volume of Shonen Jump for the last 50 years, and you're going to Japan, by all means, check out the Shonen Jump exhibition. If you do, send some pictures. I, I really want to see what this thing looks like in reality. If you're able to take pictures, that seems kind of cool. Okay, and my supervisor thought I had a creepy laugh. Well, apparently, I got nothing on Alexa. Yep, Amazon has announced that they are going to be fixing the creepy laughs that are coming out of all their Alexas. Now, for those of you that have happily been living under a rock like me for the last few centuries, what is Alexa? Well, it's that tiny little cylindrical thing that a lot of people have in their home where they basically make her out to be their personal little slave. Or butler, or whatever you want to call her, or it, or whatever you want to call the device. It's basically your own little reminder, artificial intelligence sort of thing without a mind of its own. So, over the past few days, users with Alexa-enabled devices have reported hearing strange, unprompted laughter. <laughs> Amazon uh, responded to the creepiness today in a statement to The Verge saying, We are aware of this and are working to fix it. Yeah. Uh, later on in the day, Amazon said it planned its plan fix uh, will involve disabling the phrase Alexa laugh and changing the command to Alexa can you laugh. 
The company says the latter phrase is less likely to have false positives. Or in other words, the Alexa software is likely to mistake common words and phrases that sound similar to the one that makes Alexa start laughing. Well, I'm glad they made that into layman's terms for us to understand. We are also changing Alexa's response from simply laughter to, sure, I can laugh, followed by laughter. An Amazon spokesperson said. That doesn't exactly, in my opinion, help the issue. If you're having Alexa do a creepy laugh, how is Alexa going, sure, I can laugh, and then continuing to laugh, how is that going to make things any better? I mean, it's still probably going to be a creepy laugh that's not helping matters here. So, this was brought up... Uh, one person uh, on Twitter, at Cap Handlebar, uh, posted a tweet and a, a video <coughs> on this uh, with uh, so Alexa saying, So Alexa decided to laugh randomly while I was in the kitchen. It freaked another Twitter user, uh, at Snooty Juicer, uh, and him out, and them out. Uh, I thought a kid was laughing behind me. I did see this uh, clip. It creeped me the hell out. All you hear is, heh, heh, heh. And I'm like, what? That, ugh. That would just creep me out, though, if I had a device that would be laughing at me randomly. That bugs the crap out of me. But anyway... They're planning to fix it. Happily, it will be fixed. But I just get a kick out of this. I mean, the last person that ever told me I had a creepy laugh was my supervisor at work. And now, apparently, Alexa's got a creepier laugh than me. Hmm. My, my, my. Isn't it impressive how the world changes and turns, huh? Okay. Come take my hand. Let's go into the Wayback Machine that I swiped off of a dog and his plucky young assistant. And let's go back to the good old yesteryear of 2004. Yes, 2004. When the world was somewhat a nicer place. I myself was much more handsome and rogue and debonair than I am now. Ah, yes, those were the days when I pretty much had oodles of people swooning at my feet. Yeah, who am I kidding? I was in freaking high school. Yeah, I was in high school. Who am I kidding? But anyway... 2004 had another moment. Uh, it was the year that the Yu-Gi-Oh! movie was released. For those of you that have missed that or didn't want to pick up the DVD because who would want to? Good news! It's coming back to theaters for two days! Yay! Yep, so um, unless you listen to my podcast really early in the morning on Sundays... Uh, you're going to miss the Sunday one, but you can try to hit the Monday one if you're interested. So, what exactly is it coming back? Well, it's making a limited two-day event, and you got to check out theaters near you for purchase and ticket details. In all honesty, just watch the movie. You can easily find the DVD on eBay for like two or three bucks. Hell, I even own a copy of it yet, and it's not a good movie. It, it, it sucks. The animation quality in that is piss poor. So... Here's the whole thing. Uh, Heroic Yugi squares off against arch-rival Kaiba in an adventure even more dangerous when the imaginary monsters and their playing cards become ferociously real. And when an old, vil an old evil enters the fray, who will win this ultimate smackdown? Yeah. Whether you're a novice duelist or a professional, you'll want to watch and find out. Eh, no, you really won't. Uh, the movie was directed by Hatsuki, Suji, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh GX, Cardfight Vanguard. Three very good uh, card-based animes, I will admit that. Uh, the animation uh, produ uh, productions by Studio Gallop. It did Initial D and Ice Shield 21. Ugh. Uh, you can also look forward to the same exciting feature-length adventure, including all your favorite dub cast members, with a gloriously remastered sheen. I want to quote Case Closed here for a moment, if I may. Uh, Detective Richard Moore once made a comment 
in one of the cases, a 10 cent shine on some 2 cent shoes still leaves you with some cruddy footwear. Now, I will defend anime from people that hate it till my dying breath. Yu-Gi-Oh! is one that will always be on my list to defend. However, this movie, I will gladly jump the other side of the fence and say how much it sucks. And I actually saw this in theaters. When this came out, I actually saw this in theaters. I went to the El Cheapo Theater uh, by where I live. It's sadly no longer uh, in business. It's becoming a Popeye's. Yes, Popeye's chicken. Yeah. So, unfortunately, uh, I did see this movie. Took my mom to go see it because, well, it the theater was X amount of miles away. I can't drive. I can't walk. Need an adult. It's like, hey, she's getting a free movie out of it because I paid for it out of my allowance. I mostly just wanted the cards. No, no, I'm not kidding. Because with almost every Yu-Gi-Oh! movie that ever comes out in theaters, you get a card. Yes, you get a trading card. Uh, for this one, we got uh, Wadapon and Sorcerer of Dark Magic, respectively. And the movie sucked. I'm just going to come right out and say it. The movie sucked. I paid a buck a piece to get for my mom and I to go in. And the snack, because I, I had to get something to drink. I can, Like I said, I can sit through a movie without having popcorn or anything. And I know my mom's probably laughing at me right now because we've been watching movies in the afternoons on the weekends with my grandfather. And I usually have like a snack with me. Yeah, it's home. It's different. Uh, but at the movie theater, I can sit through a movie at a movie theater without having to have a thing of popcorn. As long as I ate something earlier in the day. And I can sit there perfectly content without food. However, I have to have something to drink during this movie. Because you're sitting there for two hours at least. Like an hour and a half to two hours. There is no way I could do that without having something to drink. And at the El Cheapo Theater, that's how they got you. Because the... Ticket price to get in was cheap. The drinks cost you five bucks for a small. Five bucks. That's how they made the difference up. And you wonder why they're becoming a Popeyes. Yep. I mean, now the movie sucked. I won't deny that. But here's the kicker, though, with this. Now, in addition to the feature itself, moviegoers will get a chance to check out the English dubbed premiere of the first episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! V-Reigns. The sixth Yu-Gi-Oh! anime series. Yes, the one that introduced Link Monsters, which so many fans of the card game believe killed it. Me included. I thought Link Monsters were going to be way different than what they were preaching them to be. Hundreds of select movie theaters are getting into the fun, are getting in on the fun, I should say, nationwide, and the screenings will take place on Sunday, March 11th at 12.55 p.m. And Monday, March 12th at 7 p.m. Secure your tickets online. And as Yugi would always say, get ready to do 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 Yeah. Here are my thoughts. Like I said, the original Yu-Gi-Oh! movie sucked. I'm not going to deny that. If you want to see a decent one, Dark Side of Dimensions. Way, way, way. Way better. Uh, you want to see a really good... Well, that's a really good one. You want to see uh, the middle one in between, Bonds Beyond Time. That's a good one. Um, Dark Side of Dimensions. I saw that in theaters last year. Whoo, boy! Blew me away. I will always remember how great that one was. But in all honesty, like I said, when it comes down to this... You're literally just thinking, do I want to go to the movies to see this remastered? And, like I said, it comes back down to what Detective Richard Moore once said. A 10 cent shine on some 2 cent shoes will still leave you with some cruddy footwear. So, a brand new sheen on a crappy movie still leaves you with a crappy movie that's just really, really bright. And, I, I just... I, I can't see spending the money to go see that. I don't see anybody that really would want to... I mean, unless you didn't see it before or you're new to the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise, I don't see you wanting to drop the money to go see this. Especially in this day and age. You can just wait 
until like a decent anime flick comes to theaters. Because a lot of theaters are doing this now. Um, ever since they got like the sales reports for how some of these animated films that were in for like a limited theatrical run started doing really well, it's like, huh, we should do these like once or twice a month. That'll really help bolster our sales. Because you're getting a group of people that normally don't go to the movies. At least don't go to see something all the time. It's like, you know what? We're getting this group of people in. I mean, I went to go see Battle of Gods when it came out. I still have the ticket stub for it. Because that is the one movie that I enjoyed going to see. When I got there and I arrived two hours. Two hours before the movie was set to start. Because I wanted to see this movie. I wanted to see it in theaters. Granted, I could have just watched it subbed online. And my one friend told me, just watch it online. I don't want to watch it online. Why are you going to spend the $10 to go to the movies? It's the matinee. I'm only going to be spending 5 And it's like, I went to the movies. I wanted to see it. I liked it. I'm sitting there. I had my little Goku figure with me. My Super Saiyan Goku figure with me. And I'm watching the movie, and when I got there, like I said, two hours before the movie starts, I got plenty of time, got my ticket, I was happy. I went in, got a good seat, I'm sitting there, I'm going, I'm going to love this movie. By the time the movie started, if I counted right, there were about six empty seats. Two of which were broken, and four of which were vacant. That was it. Out of a theater that seats at least 45 to 50 people, there were six empty seats. That is impressive. And for stuff like this, that's just the way it goes. I mean, the anime movie industry is starting to really boom with this limited edition stuff. But having this movie come out for a two-day limited run, to me, not such a good idea. Then again, I don't make decisions on things. I don't know everything in the world. If I did, I'd be sitting upon a mountainside charging $5 an answer and just raking in the dough with every stupid question people ask. And I mean every question. Yeah. But anyway, uh, for those of you that are interested, like I said, uh, if you listen to my podcast early enough, I, I usually try to get it uploaded early enough, it'll be... Um, 12.55 p.m. on Sunday the 11th, or in all honesty, just shoot for the 7 p.m. showing on a Monday if it's at a theater near you. If not, just look it up online or buy the DVD on eBay, because I guarantee you, you'll find it cheap. Fact B, I might even put the copy that I have up on eBay. Then you will find it cheap. You won't have to go too far to look either. Alrighty, folks, that's going to do it this week for the absolutely, completely random podcast. So, how do I end this thing every single week? Well, it's simple. If you have any topic suggestions that you'd like me to talk about, there are four ways you can let me know about them. Drop something in the discussion section of my YouTube channel. I do check that occasionally during the week. Send me an email at acrpodcast at gmail.com. I do check that thing. I didn't get a chance to check that this week, though, but I usually do check that at least once a week as well. You can tweet them to me, at Otaku Roads, at Twitter. And you can post it on the wall on my Facebook page, WebDesigner18 on Facebook. So until next week, and keep in mind that I might be a little tired and I apologize in advance if I seem that way. Until next week... I'm Andrew Rhodes, and this is the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast. Bye, everybody, and have a wonderful week.